Sitting next to me, Paul Farkas. Hi, everyone. And tonight is all about getting comfortable fitting sclera lenses. And uh, critically, this is going to be our first ever wet lab. So you're going to see some really exciting stuff tonight. Our format's going to be a little different than usual. Um, we're, we're really fortunate to have Jeff Sonsino. You might remember Jeff has done webinars for us in the past. Um, he's a, a great researcher. He actually was at uh, Vanderbilt for a number of years. Um, he focuses on, co on complex contact lens fits, and he dedicates about half of his time to doing clinical research. So um, you'll definitely want to listen to what he has to say when he explains uh, how to go about fitting um, sclera lenses. And Paul is pointing at me and then pointing at himself. So I think I'm, 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 I'm really excited. <laughs> because you know, the last time I touched a scleral lens oh boy. was before you were born, Adam. Uh, Way before you were born. Wow. And it was when I had to do the diplomate exam for the American Academy of Optometry for the diplomate section on contact lenses. And part of the deal was you had to be able to not only fit a scleral lens, but to take a mold of the eye using something called dental moldite. So there we all were having this stuff in your eye. What do, what do you think of that That's dedication to try to get this diplomate? Uh, and, uh, and if you got through that, then you first then had to uh, modify a scleral lens. And you used the modifying tools with dental tools. They were like dental burrs. I almost cut my finger off on that. And, you know, and I said, you know, I don't think the scleral lens business is for me. But, uh, you know, yeah, and, and in those days, Contact lens fitting was an art. It wasn't really a science. We're talking about like Mad Men era, right? <laughs> yeah, just about that time. And <laughs> it wasn't a science. It was art. As a matter of fact, there was one company, a true story, whose unfortunate slogan was, our lenses are works of art. No two are were alike. <laughs> and that's so. <laughs> you couldn't get in two hard lenses that, that were exactly the same fit. But luckily for us, uh, the international companies came along when soft lenses arrived. And then we had uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, felt that soft lenses were sort of a drug. Uh, so you had to do research before it got approved. So the science of contact lenses became normal. And that was, as it says, uh, as we keep saying, that was the history. And we're, here we are today. And what comes around goes around. Yeah, and it's actually, you know, you're going you're gonna to witness when you, when you watch this how far technology has actually come. Um, you know, not only is technology enabling us to actually do this presentation tonight, uh, but you'll, you'll see the use of technology to actually fit scleral lenses and without cutting your finger off, as Paul might have. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, I, I think we chatted enough, Adam. Yeah. The late comers should have now had yep. that pen and, and pencil. I, I would just like to mention, too, that uh, we have Cassandra Gordon here from Visionary um, and Eric Marshall from Visionary as well. So... Uh, if there are really detailed questions about uh, the product that Jeff is going to be showing you, we can always stop and ask them as well. So with all that said, why don't we uh, turn it over to Dr. Sonsino. Thanks, Adam, and, and thanks, Paul, for being here. It's, it's, pretty, it's an honor to share the stage, the virtual stage with you. Uh, and thanks to everybody for coming and spending a night with us. I am super pumped about this lecture it, because it's not really a lecture. It's going to be a completely interactive thing where we actually show you video of, uh, of me fitting an actual live patient uh, with a Europa scleral. Um, you know, this is one of my favorite mo modalities to fit and to research, and so I think this should be a lot of fun tonight. So just by way of disclosures, um, the webinar sponsors tonight are Visionary Optics and Bausch & Lomb. I'm a consultant for Synergize, where I am their director of clinical studies. I'm a consultant with Alcon. I'm a principal in a low vision company, and I get research support from Visioneering. Uh, this lecture will talk about off-label use, and I'll point that out to you when, when we start talking about it. I'm going to give you a short primer on what you need in your clinic to get started. We're going to talk about who to fit, some different lens designs, but we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight actually fitting a patient with lenses. So how do you get started fitting sclerals? We'll separate this into needs and wants. Scleral lenses really cannot be fit empirically. This is because prediction of an initial trial lens is not entirely accurate. It's kind of like what Paul said earlier. Um, it is, there, there's a bunch of art to this, even though a lot of it is science. Muriel Shornak uh, is a collaborator of mine, and she published a, a paper, the first paper that stated that corneal topography really cannot be used effectively to predict a scleral lens base curve. 
And this finding was confirmed in an OBS paper my group published last year. So next, you'll need a healthy supply of sterile saline. Um, especially in the beginning, you'll burn through a lot of saline while you, your staff, or the patients are inserting and reinserting lenses. When the patient leaves your office, they'll use sterile, non-preserved nebulizer saline. Now this is off-label use, but it really is the best solution for filling sclerals. There are really two good ways of assessing scleral vault. The first is using a slit beam angled at 45 degrees. So you want to use a good slit lamp where you can drill down to an optic section. The second way to assess vault is using OCT. With OCT, you can actually measure the height of the post-lens tear reservoir. The post-lens tear reservoir is the area of space that is the distance between the posterior surface of the lens and the cornea. Here's an example of the technique of using a slit beam to judge the vault. As you pass the beam through the lens, you see reflecting at various surfaces. So I'm going to get my pointer here. And here's the beam as it reflects the anterior surface of the scleral lens, the posterior surface of the scleral lens. This is the corneal epithelium. This is the corneal stroma. And lastly, the endothelium. And so the space that we're concerned with is the area between the posterior surface of the, of the contact lens and the corneal endothelium. This is what's referred to as the post-lens tear reservoir, this area right here. Now, when we talk about, uh, and when I'm actually showing you the images of what I'm looking at with the patient, we're going to flash these up. And what I want you to pay particular attention to is this space right back here. Now, it will take some practice to be able to judge the vault, but you can compare the thickness of the reservoir to the known thickness of the scleral lens or the approximate thickness of the cornea. A much more precise way to judge the vault is with the caliper tools on the OCT. When you're measuring, make sure that you're taking a line scan. And a line scan is a single cross-sectional snapshot. And make sure you take that line scan at the highest point on the cornea. In this case, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. In this, this case, this is a case of a keratocone. Uh, this is the apex of the cone, inferotemporally, right about here. No, right about here. Okay? So we are taking a line scan right through the apex of the cone, which is not central through the, the pupil. Um, we can then use the caliper tool to determine the exact vault. And in this case, we're talking about 275 microns. A wonderful free resource to you is F. van der Werp's Scleral Lens Manual. It's a must read for any new fitter. And it's free. So you can just get online on Pacific University's website and check it out. There are two chief reasons to reach for a scleral lens. Dry eyes and irregular corneas. The key is the post-lens tear reservoir. The post-lens tear reservoir creates a wonderful bath for a dry cornea. Conditions ripe for fitting include Stevens-Johnson syndrome, ocular graft versus host, Sjogren's, end-stage MGD, and surgical or traumatic resection of the lacrimal gland you're probably not going to use uh, sclerals for contact lens-induced dry eye patients. Sclerals are a great neutralizer for any type of corneal irregularity as well. Conditions which I fit routinely are keratoconus, pellucid, Salzman's, post-RK, post-PK, and post-Intax. But then you can also use sclerals for your corneal train wrecks. This patient is post-LASIK times two and has intrastrom intrastromal corneal ring segments. In fact, I'm giving a two-hour lecture on this patient and other train wrecks and contact lenses at the AOA conference uh, for the Sacramento Valley Optometric Society in Taos, New Mexico, 
and at the Arizona State Chapter of the Academy if anyone is interested in finding out more. Let's touch on currently available lens designs. Nearly every gas perm company makes a semi-scleral lens. I really do not fit semi-sclerals anymore because of their problematic design flaw. They are built to rest right on the limbal stem cells at the palisades of vote. This may be fine for normal corneas and eyes, but the reason you're fitting a large diameter lens is likely that there's some type of corneal irregularity. With diseased eyes, you don't want to have any mechanical insult to the limbal stem cells. I see too many semi-scleral patients referred in by other doctors that have tight lens syndromes, corneal edema, and graft rejections. The Jupiter lens has been the market leading full diameter scleral lens for the past 10 years. I still use this lens on some legacy patients who are perfectly stable and happy with it, but my lens of choice now has become the Europa. The Europa is the first second generation scleral lens. The idea was to incorporate all of the most common changes that practitioners were making to the Jupiter lens to enhance its fitting capabilities. Let's talk about the Europa scleral. There were key design improvements from the Jupiter to the Europa. First, the Europa has a significantly increased optic zone, which increases its vaulting capability of the cornea. Second, the Europa has a, lent, the, the, the Europa has a reverse geometry uh, incorporated into the overall sagittal depth to improve mid-peripheral clearance. It's designed to fit both prolate and oblate corneas. And when I say prolate, I mean that's the, that the cornea is steepest in the center and flattens towards the periphery. Examples of a prolate cornea would include the normal cornea and in keratoconus. Oblate means that the cornea is flattest in the center and steepens towards the periphery. An example of this would be post-refractive LASIK for myopia or some eyes that have had a corneal transplant. These are the, the classic table-shaped eyes. Third, the Europa design has an enhanced haptic profile that decreases conjunctival compression and vessel blanching. The Europa scleral has improved fitting efficiency and success as compared to Jupiter lenses. There are only four button manufacturers who produce buttons large enough for full sclerals. I tend to use Optimum for severe dry eye patients, and I tend to use XO and XO2 for everyone else. I'm very concerned with DK. Remember that the only oxygen supplied to the cornea and sclera is whatever oxygen is dissolved in the saline and whatever can diffuse through the lens material. So to get the decay of high and hyperpermeable material is highly desirable to me. Prepping the lenses, that's as simple as placing the lens on the DMV. The DMV is the little inserter tool which is in, in this picture. And filling the reservoir with saline. One clinical pearl is to make sure that the DMV is conditioned properly. Remember that it contacts the lens at the visual axis. So if it dries out the front surface, even just a little bit, you've lost before you even start. Well, let's get to it. Uh, this is the first video wet lab on sclerals. And Adam, if we're ready to roll, I think uh, we can start the video. All right, everyone, everyone, you're part of history right now. This is the first time we've ever done it with a crowd this big. We have hundreds of you out there right now. So uh, let's get the videos going. and. Uh, Good luck to all of us. OK, actually, even before we start it, I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, I'm, you're going to hear in the video me furiously clicking away at, at my camera. And what I'm doing is I'm taking a ton of pictures. And what I've done post, um, what do you call it, post uh, production, is I've picked the best pictures to put on uh, the screen. And so we will actually interject what I'm seeing through the slit lamp and the OCT on the screen while I'm talking about it. So you'll hear the shutter click and click and clicking, but you may only see one or two images. And one other point, uh, for those of you that have questions, uh, you can put it in that little box, and they'll be answered at the end of the pr production. Exactly. Now, I may stop the, the video here and there to, to uh, interject things. So let's get going. 
I'd like to introduce you to Darlene. Darlene is a patient with Salzman's nodular degeneration. And the reason we picked uh, Darlene to come in today and, and show you guys is that, you know, this is not an ordinary case of, you know, an ordinary cornea. And when you're fitting scleral lenses, oftentimes you are going to have cases that aren't in the ordinary. And so this should be very fun today. Uh, to give you some background on some of her numbers, uh, her refraction is plus 825, minus 7, axis 5 in the right eye, and that gives 2030 best corrected vision. And in the left eye, she has plus 5, minus 3, axis 45, which gives a best corrected acuity of 2060. So this is our starting point. This is the goal that we want to, to meet or exceed with the scleral lenses. Um, here we'll put up on the screen her, her topographies. These are Medmont topographies. And the simulated Ks in the right eye you can see are 43.6 by 35.6. And in the left eye the simulated Ks are 45.0 uh, by 41.2. So Darlene, uh, we will get started now. We're now going to select some lenses uh, to put on Darlene. And when you're selecting lenses, uh, well, first of all, you always need to fit uh, Europa sclerals uh, diagnostically. So you, you need to have a, di a diagnostic fitting set in order to do this properly. And so here we have our diagnostic fitting set. Um, we're going to open the book. And I like to start out with the larger diameters first. So we have actually two diagnostic fitting sets. We have a, an 18.0. Uh, diameter set and we also have a 16.0 diameter set and that will give you more uh, ability to tune the diameter for what your patient's needs are. Now with a patient with Salzman's nodular degeneration I want to have a fairly large lens so that we will be able to span the entire cornea and we're not landing on the limbus. Um, that's going to be very important for any raised areas that we're trying to get above. And so most oftentimes, you know, I'm using uh, a, a standard Europa, but then I'm going to customize it. And most likely what we're going to do today is we're going to increase the optical zone of these lenses to completely clear any nodules that may be in the periphery. Uh, so back to our topographies. And um, we'll, we'll look at these topographies again because we're going to, we're going to, judge our, or we're going to pick our um, first trial lens based on the topography. Now it's very interesting. Uh, Muriel Shornack uh, published a paper um, that said essentially um, you cannot base your uh, trial lens fitting of scleral lenses on the topography. Uh, we published a paper in 2012 that backed up that same assertion. But nonetheless you need to start somewhere. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start on K, uh, on the steep K, sorry, uh, on the right eye, which was right around 43. So we're going to select our diagnostic lens that is base curve of 43 um, for the right one. And then for fun, on the left eye, we're going to fit uh, the lens two diopters steeper. Um, the, the, the typical idea with a patient with keratoconus or uh, some other uh, corneal irregularity is to fit two diopters steeper than steep K. And that should give you um, the ability to vault any uh, abnormality. But in our case, because of, it, because of the Salzmans, uh, we want to fit more oblately. And so we're going to pick um, something that's on K for the right eye. But just for fun, we're going to go two diopters steeper on the left eye. Uh, we're going to pick, since our steep K was around 45, we're going to pick a lens that is 47 diopters in curvature. So, so we're ready to insert lenses and one of the most important factors in your success in getting a lens on a patient is the patient's body posture. Um, having the correct posture will ensure that you have a good target to put that lens onto. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have Darlene lean forward with her elbows on her knees, that's it, and we're going to have her tuck her chin into her chest, that's it. And now you can see that her cornea is staring straight at the ground. And by doing that, you will have that good target to put the lens onto. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the lens and my middle finger, 
is going to pull down her lower lid and with my other finger I'm going to pin the upper lid against the uh, maxillary bone. And so uh, by doing that you're going to be able to immo that's the superior orbital rim. That's one of the, the dangers of doing things live is you use the wrong words. And get them out of the way so that you can get a lens on. Okay, so let's give this a shot. So Darlene, you're going to look straight down. I'm going to immobilize the upper lid, move the lower lid out of the way, and close. And you can see that one of the keys was that I didn't move the plunger away until I had her eyelids closed. And the eyelids will grab the lens onto the eye. So now, let's take a look and let's see how we did. We can visually inspect to see if we trapped an air bubble. And so let's get pretty close. And I don't see any air bubbles, so I think we did a pretty darn good job. All right, let's repeat this on the other eye. Now, we're going to do the same thing. Darlene, I'm going to have you lean over, tuck your chin down. Good. I'm going to come here, immobilize the upper lid, move the lower lid out of the way, and close. That's great. Now, I'm going to warn you that not every patient is this compliant. Darlene did a great job in, in not flinching. But a lot of times you're going to have the patient flinch as soon as you come close to the cornea. So let's see how we did on the other eye. And it looks very, very good. I don't see any visible air bubbles. Now that we've inserted lenses, we're going to wait a good 20 to 25 minutes. And that allows for the lenses to settle onto the eye and it allows us to make sure that we we're judging these lenses appropriately. And so this is the great thing about doing a webinar is we can stop time. We'll start again as soon as we have 20 to 25 minutes on the eye. All right, now that we've waited uh, the appropriate amount of time, uh, we're ready to inspect these lenses. And the very first thing that I'd like to know, even before I walk in the room, I have my technicians ask about the comfort of the lens. And so since we don't have our techs here today, we're going to ask ourselves. Darlene, um, tell me, how do these lenses feel? Uh, the left feels good. I can feel the right one. Okay, where do you feel it? Uh, just up in this area. So off to the side. All right, so what that tells me right off the bat is that this lens is impacting uh, the cornea somewhere. So it's hitting the cornea. So in my mind, I know that I'm going to be looking for that. Um, it doesn't tell us more sensitive information than that, but it tells me that somewhere this lens is impinging either the sclera or the cornea. Um, all right, so next, let's take a look using the slip beam. So we pull our slip lamp in front and come on forward there. Good. And since you're not sitting in my office looking at the slip beam, what we will be doing though is taking some pictures and we'll flash that up on the screen. And so the very first thing that I notice, and let's see if we can show this. You'll hear the, the flash of my, um, of my camera. The very first thing I notice is that the lens is not wetting incredibly well. We see areas of dry spots, and that's really just because this is a trial lens. When the lens comes from the manufacturer, uh, th those issues are resolved. Okay, the next thing I want to inspect is I want to get an idea of the magnitude of the vault. Actually, you know what, I will show you a trick here before we get into that. Um, if you do have the situation where the lenses are wetting poorly, uh, one trick that you can use is you can take a Q-tip moistened just with regular saline or gas perm solution for that matter. And you can literally squeegee the front surface of the lens. And 
and that just restores a good front surface for you to work with when you're evaluating the lenses. And you can see the difference here. Okay, so now let's get an idea of the amount of vault of this lens over the cornea. So I'm going to bring my slip beam to a 45 degree angle. I'm going to bring it down to an optic section and I'm going to increase the mag quite significantly. And so what we notice here is there is quite a bit of post lens tear reservoir that's available to us. Um, the post lens tear this is not the greatest image um, that you'll see in this webinar. It kind of came out a little bit dark. Um, where the two arrows are are the post lens tear reservoir. And as we get into more optic sections, you'll be able to see this much better. And the lens and the whole system. So what we notice is right off the bat, centrally, we have adequate vault. I'm going to look off to the side now, off to the periphery, and watch that vault as it goes all the way over the, to the limbus. That's pretty good. Now, the second thing that we are going to inspect is the alignment of the haptic on the sclera. Okay, so Darlene, I'm going to have you look slightly to the left. That's it. And let's make sure these images are coming out before we get too much further into this. to make sure that there's no impingement or compression of these conjunctival blood vessels. Now look down for me. And here we have a very good alignment of the haptic. I'm going to flash up on the screen an image of a haptic that is not well aligned and that there's actually compression. You can see that it chokes off the, the blood vessels as they go through uh, the edge of the lens, and that's a sign that you need to flatten uh, the haptic. Okay, let's look at the other eye now. Okay, so likewise, there's poor wetting on the front surface of this lens, but it's actually better than the other eye, so I don't think we need to squeegee this eye. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to increase our magnification. We're going to bring our slip beam to 45 degrees. We're going to trim it down to an optic section. And we're going to judge the vault. Now, on this side, you can see that there's quite a bit more vault than the right eye. Now remember, this is the steeper base curve. So, so here you can see, and let me know if you don't see my arrow. Um, but here we have that nice post lens tear reservoir. This is the anterior surface of the cornea, and right there is the posterior surface of the lens. So this is all nice post lens tear reservoir here. It's giving us an idea of where we're vaulting the cornea. Now as we get off to the periphery, the vault declines quite a bit. And let's look nasally as well. Good. Okay, now 
let's inspect the haptic here. Darlene, take a look off to the left for me. Here we get a little bit of compression of these conjunctival blood vessels. So we're going to change this when we make our first lens order. Now look up for me. Look straight up. That's it. We remember that uh, when I asked her if she felt these lenses, she did notice that she uh, felt the right one. And so we're going to try to see if we can find that. Come on back in here, Darlene, and let's take a look. We're going to go back to our optics section. see if we can identify an area and here here it is so you can see with my slip beam we have a vault centrally it's not it's about one-third of the thickness of the cornea and then as we move more nasal, that vault disappears. So my guess is that if we look at the OCT, we're going to find that nasally we're bearing right on that cornea. Okay, sit back. So, in fact, next, what we are going to do, since we have the luxury of the, the device, is we're going to look with OCT. It's not necessary that you inspect uh, scleral lenses with OCT, but it certainly is helpful. Now we're inspecting with OCT, and so... I'm going to do some line scans, and I'm going to make sure to have the infrared beam pointed here. There are many uh, OCTs on the market that will accomplish what you want to do with scleral lenses. Okay. And so what we talked about with the slit lamp inspection is exactly the case. With OCT, we can see we're bearing on a nodule nasally. To highlight this a little bit better, if you can see my pointer, you know, as the post posterior surface of the lens comes and lands on the cornea, this is landing on a nodule, and so there's no space in between here. That's problematic. which is producing the sensation that she's noticing. Okay. Let's take a look at the other eye. With the OCT, I'm trying to judge the amount of vault And I'm also looking for any areas where the 
posterior surface of that lens is impinging on the cornea. Okay, and on the left eye we can see we have excessive vol, which is likely to decrease the visual acuity once we have our over-refraction in place. Now it's very interesting about this, this question of decreasing the visual acuity with excessive vol. Um, there is not one peer-reviewed literature citation which says that excessive vault of either a corneal gas perm or a scleral gas perm results in poor vision, yet we see this anecdotally all the time. Okay, sit back. And there we have our OCT. So let's review this. Next step is going to be to over refract the lenses. And so this is what we do all day, every day. Everyone here knows how to do this. But the most important thing that I'll tell you is to make sure that when you're doing your over refraction, you do a sphero cylindrical over refraction. Because with uh, a, a Europa scleral, we have the ability to, to um, put, um, uh, to stabilize it um, using slab off uh, prism. And that gives the ability to put a spherocylindrical prescription into the lens. You can maximize acuity much, much better. So you can eliminate um, corneal astigmatism just with the post lens tear reservoir, but you can uh, eliminate internal astigmatism with a spherocylindrical um, refraction on top of, uh, on the front surface of the lens. So judging by the fits of both of these lenses on uh, both slit lamp inspection and OCT inspection, uh, my plan for Darlene is I want to add more uh, reverse curve, reverse geometry curve to that right one to get it to, instead of um, sitting on the cornea at the periphery, I want it to sit off of the cornea. I want the, the, the optic zone to be broader and flatter so that it sits off of the nodules and instead lands more peripherally onto the eye. So we're going to add two diopters of reverse curve. Um, we're also going to increase the optic zone diameter in that right eye. By increasing the optic zone diameter, we bring it off of the nodules and we're going to change the power based on our over refraction. In the left eye, I, you know, I think we need to decrease the vault. So we're going to go from a 47 diopter vault to a 44 diopter vault. We're going to take it about three diopters down um, and we're going to change the power accordingly. Now one of the neat things about designing uh, Europa Sclerals is that the, the, um, uh, the, the consultation department at Visionary is just incredible. This is a fitters company and so you know they have hardcore contact lens specialists that can help you at every turn. These guys are amazing. Eric is, is the person that I deal with the most and he is just wonderful. So I'll tell him what I want and he'll help me make those calculations. So now we're ready to remove the lenses. In order to remove the lenses you're going to need a, uh, a scleral remover and so these are uh, closed on the bottom so they actually will create suction. Um, in order to remove the lens I want to oppose the, the suction device to the center of the lens and the goal is to break the suction. So I'll kind of tilt it up and down left and right until we can break that suction. Once you break the suction the lens will come right off. Let's give that a shot now. Okay, so I'll stand and I'll have Darlene chin up and look straight ahead. And we broke the suction and it came right off. You can see I'm not pulling straight out. If I'm pulling straight out, you won't break the suction. I'm cantilevering the suction device. All right, that's the first one. Let's then make sure that it ends up in the correct trial case. We've all done that incorrectly at some point. And let's go with the other eye. And that one came right off. And it's as simple as that. 
So again, with the magic of being able to do this as a webinar, what we've done is uh, we've ordered lenses in advance uh, of Darlene coming today. And so we actually have the lenses that we were talking about describing in hand. And so now we're actually going to put these lenses on and see how we did. Um, remember, the national average for um, uh, the number of lenses uh, and the number of visits to get um, a patient properly fit with scleral lenses is somewhere in the range of three to six visits. And so this would be then our second visit and we're going to see how close we've come. You'll notice that the lenses arrive wet shipped and that is going to be very, very important. When we put these lenses on, my guess is that they're going to wet a lot better than those trial lenses that we store dry. We've now allowed the lenses to sit for 25 minutes and we are ready to inspect. But remember, the first thing I'm going to ask is how do these lenses feel? Left one feels very good. Okay. Right still has an issue. Okay, so what that tells me is we're still probably bearing on that nasal portion of the cornea. We're going to check that out to see if that's the case with both um, the slit lamp view and the OCT. So let's take a look here. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to inspect the vault and centrally. Let's get a little bit of a bag. Essentially, we have vault over the central cornea. Let's see if I can make this image. As we move towards the periphery, the temporal periphery of this lens, we still have good vault. I think that comes out in the images. All right, let's move over nasally, and I'm going to take images that are moving progressively more nasally. And it is the case that we're bearing on the nasal cornea. Let's take a look at the haptic. And now let's take a look at the other eye. When you're judging the amount of vault, what you want to do is you want to compare you want to compare to a known thickness. And so the known thickness in this case is going to be either the thickness of the cornea or the thickness of the lens itself. Sometimes it's easier to use the thickness of the lens itself because you know exactly how thick this lens is. And so when I'm looking at the vault, I see vault all the way limbus to limbus, both nasally and temporally on this left eye. Now, look over to the right. Haptic and we're looking for any compression. Look to look up for me. And 
look to the left now. Very mild compression, almost imperceptible. Look down now. And superiorly, it looks great. Okay, sit back. Now, again, let's inspect with <coughs> OCT to confirm what we did with the slip lamp. Okay, Elizabeth, can you take this camera and you come around back here and focus on the screen so we can see. Which way? Mm -hmm. That This is a cross scan which shows us a vertical slice and a horizontal slice. And now we're going to take a line scan and we're going to look directly through the pupil on that nasal portion and you can see right here we are still bearing right on that nasal cornea. Our next stop from here in terms of changing the lens is we're going to make the diameter larger. We're going to increase the overall diameter so that we have more of an optic zone to work with. We may increase the vault as well to try to get just a larger sagittal depth. Now this is the left eye. Let's see how we did. Centrally, it looks like we're clearing the cornea, which is great. And let's look with a line scan, nasally, both nasally and temporally. And yes, we're landing right on the limbus there, so that's great. That's what we want. And let's take a look temporarily here. And we have plenty of vault landing right on the limbus. Okay, so fit in the left eye looks fantastic. Now, the other thing that we can do with OCT is we can measure the exact amount of vault. So let's take a look at this left eye and we'll put our caliper tool here and we'll get this right about in the center part of the cornea which is right about here and we can see we have 225 microns of vault which is great All right, we're in good shape here. Let's see what you can see. So now we've completed our evaluation with these lenses and the only step to do from here on out is to figure out what we're going to order and um, uh, to remove the lenses. So I hope you found this um, beneficial. Darlene, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. All right, so that is the fitting video. Now let's go over a bunch. I'd like to introduce. Ooh, sorry yeah. about that. Let's, let's go over a, a couple of points. First, I want to tell you exactly what we did in terms of changing the lenses. So we started out with an 18-0 diameter lens. 
Then the second set of lenses that we put on was in 18.5. And my next order, I'm going to increase the overall diameter to 19.4. I'm also going to increase the chamber diameter by 0.5 millimeters. And we're going to put the rest of that increased diameter in peripheral curve 2, which is the landing curve. I'm going to increase the vault by steepening the base curve 2 diopters. So with those changes, we hope to be able to clear that uh, that peripheral module. Uh, that, I, I was talking about the, the right eye. The patient actually left with the, uh, the new uh, left lens. Um, probably the biggest question that we've gotten uh, on the question board is, why am I not using fluorescein? You know, everybody is taught, you know, in school and, you know, in, in different webinars and different presentations, oh, you have to use fluorescein with any gas perm lens. Fluorescein is a very imprecise way of looking at scleral lenses. Um, the majority of your sclerals are going to be for dry eye patients and for keratocones and more regular stuff. And with each of those conditions, you're going to be clearing the cornea. You're going to be clearing the apex of the cone. You're going to be clearing by you know hundreds of microns. So what exactly are you going to learn by looking at a deeper green picture? Um, a much more sensitive way of evaluating the fits, if you don't have an OCT, is by using that optic section. Because you can tell exactly how much space is behind there. With fluorescein, I mean, there's a lot of problems that go along with fluorescein. First of all, you can't tell vault over, uh, beneath 20 microns. So that's a very insensitive way of looking at a lens. Um, Adam, should we start fielding some of these questions that have come up? Yeah, there are about a million of them. So uh, before we do that, though, um, we have some additional files. And let me see if I can actually drag them onto the screen if people want to download them. Um, all about the Europa lens and, and contact information. So let me just see if I can do this. The, the software hasn't broken yet, right? So let me see if I can break it now. <laughs> uh, OK. You know, while Adam is doing this, I have one question. Uh, what, what trumps? Is patient comfort more important than your visual inspection? If you have a happy patient, but yet you see something that is not exactly to your liking as far as the fit is concerned, how do you proceed? Uh, patient comfort is one metric that you can use, but it is by no means more important than your inspection. Your inspection is going to head off um, potential problems down the road at the pass. So, you know, for example, you know, a lot of people have commented on, on the first set of lenses, oh my god, that's so much compression. Um, you know, you're probably going to create impingement if you take that lens off. And the answer was, yes, on that first set of lenses, even though she said on that left lens, hey, it's a comfortable lens, I didn't let her leave with that. And the reason I didn't is because I know that the compression, the amount of compression that we saw there was going to lead to impingement, which, you know, that's, uh, that's a physiologic problem. And so, you know, your evaluation is much more important than patient comfort. Right. And uh, does everyone out on their screen right now have a little box that says downloads? Or am I the only one? <laughs> In the lower right-hand corner of your screen. I've got it, Adam. OK, perfect. So uh, if you can see that, uh, there's actually the fitting guide there, frequently asked questions uh, and contact information and so forth, because people have been asking in the questions section. So you can just click the download button, and you can uh, download those too. So I just wanted to make sure everyone got that. And All right, let, let me pick out some of these questions, if you're ready, Absolutely. Adam. OK, so a real good question. What if you don't have an OCT? You don't need an OCT for fitting sclerals. You absolutely do not need it. In fact, I, I used to give a troubleshooting lecture. Actually, it wasn't. It was a previous lecture. We, we called it with, uh, I used to give it with Muriel Shornack at Academy every year called um, Fitting Scleral Lenses High Tech Versus Low Tech. And I'm an early adopter of technology, so whenever stuff comes out, I try it out. And you know, I get it before probably most people. And Muriel Shornack is a late adopter of technology. And so for years, she, I mean, she's probably one of the best scleral fitters in the country. And for years, she didn't have an OCT. 
And so she was using optic sections to judge vault at every part of the lens, and she was just as successful as I was. Um, let's see here. So there's a question of, of if scleral lenses sink over time. And there's a bunch of people um, that think that um, scleral lenses continue to sink on eyes indefinitely. And there are some eyes that I completely agree with that statement. Um, you know, one of, one of the, the early things that you may run into when you first start fitting scleral lenses is, you know, the patient leaves your office and you've let them sit for 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes in their lenses, and it's just sitting perfectly. You know, you're getting the perfect amount of vault. Um, and then that patient comes in nine months later, and literally that lens is sitting directly on the cornea. And we see this, right? My answer to that is different people have different rigidity to their sclera, and some people have less rigidity, and that lens will just sink over time. I mean, that's a real phenomenon. Muriel Shornack actually calls it, or she, she likens it to uh, putting a piece of furniture on the carpet. And if you put a piece of furniture on the carpet, some carpet, when you take that, you know, the, the piece of furniture off, the, the carpet springs back and it's like it was never there. Other carpet, you'll see the impression of that, that piece of furniture in infinitum. So there are different scleras that do different things. Keratocones are notorious for this. So we know that keratocones have a fundamentally different collagen structure to their cornea, and it's also the sclera. So we see it mostly in keratocones. But conversely, there are patients that I've followed for eight years in the same base curve that have exactly the same vault every single time they come in to see me. So for the people that think that they, they absolutely all of them sink over time, that's simply not true. I have one question as long as we're um, here. I, I made the trip. <laughs> uh, uh, what's the life expectancy of a scleral lens? And then when you have to replace it, uh, does it come in exactly as you anticipate the previous one? So life expectancy of a scleral is determined by the condition. Um, life, and, life expectancy of a lens that is used to treat ocular graft versus host is no more than one year. Th those patients, um, for some reason, you know, the front surface of that lens becomes exhausted because of the underlying condition. You know, I'll tell these patients, you know, I prepare them on their way out. Listen, you know, you have no meibomian gland function. You have zero meibomian gland function. So what we're doing with the scleral lens is we are protecting the cornea from drying out to the point where it doesn't evulse its contents, right? Um, but we are not going to fix the underlying problem. And so something is going to dry out. It's not going to be your cornea anymore, and you're going to be thankful for that, but it's going to be the front surface of that lens. So you're going to be taking that lens off probably three, four, five times during the day, conditioning it and putting it back on to allow that front surface to wet. And it's, not, it's going to last you no more than a year. And so these are some of the greatest patients to have because they come back to see me on the dot every single year, you know, continually. It's a, it's a legacy patient. Whereas if you have a keratocone and you're clearing the cornea and it's not causing any problems, they, that lens may last two years. So it's somewhere in, in between one to two years. And then you, you, the second part of your question, Paul, was uh, are, is it a reproducible result? And I found that it is a very reproducible result. Um, you know, I have legacy patients that, and, and Europa's uh, haven't been a, around long enough for me to, to accurately say this, although I can't imagine it's any different. But with the Jupiters uh, that I used to use, you know, these patients, we would, I would have them come in and then order these, exactly the same thing, and it fits. So this is not a, a, a Mona Lisa type um, contact lens uh, strategy anymore like it used to be back in the day. These things are very reproducible. Great. So, so then the final answer right. to that question, um, do you prepare the patient in advance that they'll need a spare pair 
before the first pair wears out. Some of these keratoconus people are blind without the lens. Uh, what do you do in between uh, the one wearing out and getting another lens? You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't think it's much of an issue. These lenses, you know, if, if I call Eric at, at Visionary and I say, I got a problem, I need a lens tomorrow, I get a lens tomorrow. So they're, they're capable of producing these things very quickly. And, and Eric, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't throw you under the bus. Now everyone's going to want their lenses tomorrow. But the point of that is um, it, it, it's possible. So we don't really run into time pressure too much with, with this company. You know, that's interesting. And in fact, when we were rehearsing, Paul was actually asking you uh, how you modify your own lenses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that's sort of a bygone era. What, what was my answer, Adam? That ship has sailed? Yes. <laughs> but it is interesting that the turnaround time can be so quick uh, to get a new lens um, from Visionary. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so there was another question. This is a very good question as well about um, the, the removal uh, DMVs. And there are some people that use the small DMV, that the tiny little one that we use for gas perms, and there are some people that use the large ones. And the, the, the answer is, you know, the question is, which is better? And the answer to that is, um, whatever works. So, you know, the majority of mine I'm able to take off with the large DMV, and I just think it's easier to manipulate. But um, some people use the small DMV, put it at the edge of the lens, and simply just lift it off. And I've used that technique as well. So, you know, both work, and there's just not a better strategy. It's just whatever works. Right. Um, so we're running a little bit short on time, but I actually had a question here, you know, from, from a novice, novice's perspective. Uh, and, you know, we, we have hundreds of people in the audience here tonight, and I'm, I'm almost certain that many of them don't fit sclera lenses frequently, if ever. Um, so the question that I have is, how do you get started? How do you walk down that path? Um, you know, I, I think what we talked about tonight, number one, get F. van der Warp's manual because it tells you everything you're going to need to know to get started. Um, number two, you sit into webinars like this. Uh, and number three, you need a fitting set. There's just no two ways around that. You, you need to have a fitting set in order to do this effectively. And then honestly, it's not that hard. You know, it's, it's like it, it's like it, it's the same strategy that you use when you get your first uh, new multifocal set. You know, it takes you a little bit of break in to learn how to use that and to learn the lens and to learn the lingo and how to talk to the patients. But really, you just dive in. I mean, everyone sitting here listening today has these skills, and it's really just a question of, of wanting to do it and jumping in and doing it. Right. Great. Well, we're running out of time, but I know that there's one thing that Paul wanted to talk about in this webinar, and he absolutely couldn't because we didn't have time, but the economics oh, right. of sclera lenses. This is something that, you know, uh, we, we, we wanted to discuss, but we're running out of time. And I think what it might be best to talk about it on OD Wire uh, sure. with, when the webinar is all over. Yeah, that, that's a whole lecture in itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess, you know, as we're running out of time here, do you have any sort of parting thoughts for us? You know, I, I will tell you that these, these are the most grateful patients in my practice. And I'll tell you, it is so exciting for me to do this. You know, today I, I got through a day of patients and, uh, you know, typically my schedule is about 40 to 50 percent complex contact lenses. But today it was just general eye care. God, I was bored. You know, but when you have these patients and you're constantly thinking about, okay, you're, you're troubleshooting it, it, it keeps you young and it keeps your mind working and it keeps you awake. So this is just, you know, it, it's fun is the point. Right. And uh, uh, Cassandra Gordon from, from Visionary would like to actually say a few words here, uh, I guess, before we go. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your evening to listen to Dr. Sincino and to watch this webinar. We really appreciate it and hope that you took a lot of information from it, as I know I did. Um, so thank you again. And if you have any questions, my contact information is in the download section. We're happy to help you get started any way possible.
And thank you for that. And, and this talk, the, the talk in its entirety, will be available on ODWire within the next couple of days. So if your video died out on you or some of the audio got choppy, you can feel free to actually come on back and, and download it. And, and Jeff, if you're game, we can have the comment section right beneath the video if you'd like to answer some more questions. Yeah, I'm up. Great. Well, Jeff, thanks so much. And, and thank you, Visionary, for sponsoring tonight's event and BNL. And I guess uh, we'll see everybody online. Good night, everyone. Good night.